Hey everybody, this is a very quick video, but with some very important information about transients in the night sky and does the military actually parse and look at astronomical data before it's made public. Uh, it's a video actually aimed at Beatrice. Hi Beatrice, this is Simon Holland. Um, we've talked in the past and I've got some really interesting information that you or one of your graduate students needs to get in touch with about an alternative sky survey from 1950s at a sister uh, observatory in California called, called Mount Wilson. Hey folks, I made a mistake that I've just checked now that I'm editing this film for you. Every time I say Mount Wilson, I don't mean Mount Wilson, I mean Lick, the Lick Observatory near San Jose. Our friend worked at both Mount Wilson and at the Lick, and this plate archive is at the Lick Observatory. So every time I say Mount Wilson in the future of this film, I misspoke. Um, Beatrice, get in touch. It's at the Lick Observatory near San Jose. Sorry about that. But first of all, for viewers, um, I think you might get a bit of the wrong impression about me and you don't really know much about me as a person or my background and why am I even on YouTube? Um, I come across as this old person debunking UFOs. Well, in fact, <laughs> and that might be true, but I'm very open-minded, by the way. But in fact, my family and best friends have always been and worked as astrophysicists in optical and radio astronomy. Uh, we know people who discovered that the universe was expanding. We know the person I can pick up the phone to who discovered pulsars, who discovered the cosmic microwave background. And uh, this is going to blow your mind. I am in daily contact, if I wanted to be, with the man who found 3i Atlas um, at the Atlas Project, because I know these people personally. Now, I'm not blowing my own trumpet. That's my background. It's actually, I had that background as a child. Uh, my family and friends, um, you know, worked at Cavendish and, and uh, in Cambridge, and later on through my darling wife, Dorothy, in Hawaii, which is a big astronomical center. And then I've also uh, got in touch with people and become friends with people at Mount Wilson. So that's the background for for viewers. I, and I'm sure Beatrice doesn't know that really either. Um, so what I've discovered, I was talking to an, my friend, our family friend, who's the archivist at Mount Wilson. Mount Wilson is the sister observatory to Palomar. Um, it's a large observatory also in California that did whole sky surveys in the 1950s on large, large, I'm talking large glass plates. And they they are just the same surveys as Mount Palomar. Um, they will have the transients uh, that Beatrice has found in her wonderful peer-reviewed work, and I think that's fantastic. Beatrice, <laughs> reach out to me, and I'll put you in touch with the archivist at Mount Wilson. Now, what's interesting is that the uh, plates at Mount Wilson are still in boxes and are glass slides with photographic emulsion on them. I think that's really important because I think the ones that you possibly worked with, talk to me, at Mount Palomar were digital copies digitized of their plates. I'm not sure if the Mount Wilson ones are digitized yet. And in fact, I hope they're not because over 70 years ago of going in and out of envelopes and inboxes and up on shelves and in, in and out for people looking at them, it's possible they got scratched and nicked. Plate defects. And if you have access to the real plates, the actual physical glass plates, you can eliminate a defect by looking at it and seeing that it's got a scratch, you know, rather than if it's digitized, you've got no actual physical proof whether that plate scratched or not. So please get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with the Mount Wilson people. Mount Wilson, by the way, are very open to SETI research. They're currently doing a program looking at micro transient flashes in space by the University of San Diego with an instrument at Mount Wilson uh, for SETI. So they're totally not close to the idea of search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And the archivist there is fascinated by your work. Um, uh, you'll know who he is. I'm not going to name him uh, when I put you in touch. So Beatrice or Beatrice's department, get in touch with me in the comments. Email me, Beatrice. You have my email. 
and I'll put you in touch with Mount Wilson. And then we can verify on the original glass plates, transients from a sister observatory just up the road, a few hundred miles from Palomar. Excellent. And in second breaking news <laughs> is Avi Loeb said that um, a lot of astrophysics of observations are parsed or filtered through the US military um, and then data is removed because of national security. Um, it's a bit of a hysterical claim, Avi, but it's actually true. Um, the one person who would know this and this is going to be really mind blowing for you, audience, is um, Larry Deneau. Larry is the software engineer with John Tonnery, who run Atlas. Atlas? Oh, yeah, you've heard of that. The people who found 3i Atlas. They are funded via NASA, and this is going to be important, to do something called a wide field survey for sub-kilometer asteroids, for near-Earth impact, um, dangerous things that could hit the Earth in the future. Every asteroid pretty well over a kilometer has already been um, uh, mapped, and we have its, um, hopefully we have its orbit unless it changes, and that's held at the Minor Planet Center in Boston. But the sub-kilometer asteroids, they uh, got funded to find those. I mean, 900 meters is pretty well the same as 1,000 meters. So they needed to find those. And they found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They do it by having two cameras in the northern hemisphere and two in the southern hemisphere, taking at least four wide-field um, uh, pictures of the visible night sky every night that they can, that it's not cloudy. And then in the morning, Larry, hi Larry, comes into his office and takes out all the single point st sources, uh, they're called stars, and he's left with um, everything that moves. Well, this is the interesting thing. Everything that moves includes 50,000, 100,000, or an unknown number of man-made objects in LEO, low Earth orbit, mid or even geostationary orbit. These are man-made objects. And of course, he's not interested in those. He's looking for the rogue uh, three I Atlas, Interstellar, or he's actually looking for asteroids. Um, by taking four pictures, he can play dot join the dots and from four uh, pictures where the asteroid is moving you can work out a trajectory that information he just passes on to the minor planet center in boston they compare it with their database and say is it already known then they update the information from the atlas new survey or is it unknown and then is it if it's unknown does it fall into the category of trivial meaning it will never interact with the earth's orbit in the future or non-trivial which is what they're really looking for is a large asteroid sub a kilometer that might in the future from the um, observations that they've made in the northern and southern hemisphere interact with the earth and become as john who runs the principal investigator of atlas says either a country or a city killer and you know humans need to know that and with enough observation you can work out when it will interact as a non-trivial impact with earth in the future there are a few um and uh hopefully they are of sufficient uh size that will actually be um you know country or city killers uh but that information goes to um, the Minor Planet Center in Boston from the Atlas Center in Hawaii, who do the uh, Atlas survey that's funded by NASA. But that's not the full story. So I was chatting to Larry about it. And I said, well, how do you get rid of the near Earth objects? You must see hundreds of airplanes and satellites and all kinds of flying saucers. And, all. and he was just joking with it about it with me and he says oh yeah well, of course before it goes to boston it goes to space command i went what so that's actually true um the atlas information does get parsed via the u.s military because they don't want every secret spy satellite 
that is visible by Atlas um, made public. Um, so for national security, it is filtered. But that's only a very specific type of survey. I mean, if you were looking at um, a detailed observation of a distant galaxy or, you know, a pulsar or a star or, a, or a, you know, if you can see exoplanets and things from Earth, uh, that information really isn't of any interest to the military. It's only these wide field surveys like Pan Stars and Atlas and a few others, of course, who are looking for for uh, Earth impact asteroids or interstellar visitors. It's absolutely brilliant, Atlas found that. I'm so, so proud to know John Tonnery and, uh, uh, you know, and the team at Atlas who actually put together, and interestingly, you'll like to, to know this, that Oumuamua was found by the same team in the same corridor, not the same team, but by Panstars. Literally, I know the corridor. You walk up to the astronomy department in Hawaii, and on the first or second floor, there's a corridor. On the right is Atlas, and on the left is Panstars. I mean, they're friends. I mean, of course, they do a slightly different um, job. Panstars has got different aperture telescopes, and it was Panstars who found the Muamua, and of course, the Atlas team on the other side of the corridor, who found three I Atlas, John um, and Larry, fantastic work. But um, yes, the Atlas wide field telescope stuff that would definitely see um, satellites and other secret military stuff does get filtered by the US military before it's passed on to the Minor Planet Center and put into public domain. The thing about astronomy, I think I've always known this from family history, is that unlike biology and chemistry and, and physics, um, which might be very close to the country who've made the discovery, astronomy is not like that. If you see something high up in the North sky and it's interesting and it's new you'll tell the world because you want every telescope available in the world to see it and verify it so astronomers astrophysicists are very open at sharing data and it is slightly worrying that data is being removed um, for national security purposes from these wide field surveys so Avi Loeb's absolutely correct but it's only the wide field ones that I'm aware of and the narrow field astronomical observations are left un untouched. And of course, you know, there's telescopes in the other part of the world, folks. It's not all in the United States. So I keep saying that for as a person who lives here in France. Um, it's a global uh, uh, thing that goes on. I don't know if other countries parse uh, wide field data. I have no idea. But um, yes, Avi's correct. It is filtered through Sky Command, Space Command, who take out national security um, secret satellites. And then the rest do then get passed on to Boston, the Minor Planet Center. And then the Minor Planet Center, link in the description, publishes open source for global community to look at what Atlas and other surveys have found. And they uh, actually give um, every asteroid like points out of 10 for bad behavior. And there's a few you can look up in like 20, you know, 53. There might be one that passes between Earth and the moon, uh, which is of a considerable size. I, I'm only saying that. I mean, you could look at that data and you can find probably half a dozen in the next century that might interact with Earth and you can look at their size. And of course, I mean, what do we do about it? Well, um, what Larry says is that it's up to really uh, a government or a global community to either warn or evacuate an area when they get more data of where it's going to hit. Or, of course, now that we have the way of actually diverting uh, an asteroid rock in space by impacting it kinetically, if we do it um, decades before it will interact with Earth's orbit, just by a tiny amount, it will be way away from Earth by the time um, uh, a, a decade passes and it will miss Earth. So uh, there needs to be an asteroid deflection um, process available for ones which could be city or country killers. But to recap, Beatrice, please reach out to the archivist, I think you know who it is, uh, Mount Wilson, get one of your graduate students over there, 
um, uh, look at their wide field star survey from the same period as your Mount Palomar survey, which is excellent. And, um, you know, you will um, verify your excellent work. Um, I'm very keen that you do that. Um, uh, I have the contacts. Please get in touch. One other thing, just one other thing, and I think I may be overstep getting out of my box a bit here, folks, but you need to listen to this. One of the things that I have been slightly critical or worried about, about Beatrice's um, Palomar survey, is that it's possible that these reflective objects aren't necessarily in geostationary orbit. They might be at other heights. And she explains the cone of um, darkness caused by night on uh, over Mount Palomar. And that's true, something would have to be at a certain height, because we know the length of the cone of the diameter of the Earth that makes nighttime. So if it's something high up above Earth, it would need to be at a certain height to um, rotate and flash, and it needs to be flat to, you know, look at my hand, it's actually reflect the light source. But um, two things that I really want to confirm on her report is that only, impl that only applies in the middle of the night. Um, a few hours after sunset and a few hours before sunrise, the altitude of an object that can reflect the light, something flat and metallic, comes way down and to the point where it's actually in Earth's atmosphere. Um, and I think she needs to eliminate the possibility of uh, payloads on thousands of spy balloons, not the balloon, the balloon doesn't reflect, but the payload, which is often a, a large metallic uh, shiny thing that was very popular in the 1950s, um, would reflect Earth's, uh, the sun's light down to Palomar a few hours after sunset and a few hours before sunrise. So uh, during the night, there is a variable height of reflected uh, objects. Um, in the middle of the night, you really are getting up to 20,000 kilometers. And that's what she says, that 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 figure is amazingly corresponds with the geostationary orbit. And it, but I'm saying that it doesn't necessarily need to be in that height during the whole night. Please answer that, Beatrice, or graduate student. Um, I'd be very interested in that. And then another thing, I was asking Larry Deneau from Atlas about Beatrice's work and how does he easily parse out airplanes or LEO objects. And he said, well, that's easy because they don't form single point sources. Um, they are streaks over the long exposure. So anything that is a streak means it's low level. It's low above the satellite, uh, low above the telescope. Um, and uh, anything over um, about 20,000 kilometers, and I don't know that figure, but I'm guessing, uh, would just be a single point source. And if it was rotating, it could go flash, move, flash, move, flash, move. But um, so, yeah, I mean, Beatrice says that in our paper, that, that she's eliminated balloons. And it's not balloons, it's payloads, um, because they would form a streak. Well, I worry about that slightly. One, because of the hours before and after sunrise that something in the Earth's atmosphere would be visible because it would be high enough to reflect sunlight uh, for a couple of hours before or after sunset on sunrise. And then second of all, uh, these payloads, forget the balloon word, just forget balloons. Balloons are just benign. They're not, nothing to do with this. The payload underneath the balloon is a flat metallic, often a flat metallic object. and But it probably is rotating. Uh -huh. So if it's rotating, it would go flash, not flash, move, flash, not flash, move, flash. So you would get single point sources. If it was if it was always reflecting the sunlight and moved, you would get a streak. But if it was rotating, you would get periods where it wasn't reflecting. So you'd get dot, fla uh, black, dot, black, dot. And that could be a trick that you think that the object is higher than it is. Is that possible? Or am I just talking my normal bollocks? I don't know. Bollocks is the answer. The truth is out there.